there's trillions of planets just in the Milky Way. The chance of there not being life is actually really small. All the building blocks for life are, are we find them in gas clouds, on comets. You know, anything to build DNA is just floating around all over the universe. So it's not something that's really rare. So if it can happen here, it can certainly happen somewhere else. What is the difference between the space race in the 60s versus the space race right now? Well, in the 60s, I think uh, it was motivated by uh, political reasons. Um, you know, the United States versus Russia in particular, um, you know, it was, you know, who could beat who and a lot of fear out of the Cold War, uh, you know, because the Russians launched the satellite first in, in 57. And that scared a lot of people because that means they could launch a nuke, too. Um, so I think it's mostly born out of fear and competition with, with other nations. And, you know, when governments spend lots of money, it's usually because of that. It's because of fear or, or competing with another nation, you know, national security. <clears throat> um, if you look at you know throughout history, the whole Great Wall, everything else is all the big things that they've built is for that. Um, today's space race is is completely different. Um, so it's inspired. Uh, it was inspired by the original uh, space race and going to the moon. And when we stopped in uh, seventy two, the last time we went to the moon, you know the government says, "Okay, we did it. We beat the Russians. Just we're done." <laughs> yeah. Where today it's uh, it's commercial. So. You've got SpaceX and, um, uh, you know, uh, Virgin Orbit. You've got all, you know, all these different companies, you know, going to space. And uh, they're doing it for commercial reasons. So they're not going to just stop after a few years and be like, oh, okay, we, we completed it. We're done. Because, no, <laughs> you don't buy hardware, you know, and do all this to not make a profit. So I think this time it's for good. Um, you know, the, the, and the competition is getting more and more competition there's more and more people starting rocket companies and and the cost of launch is coming down really quickly because of that competition and that's encouraging other companies to say hey you know i can launch a large satellite for a million bucks you know that's less than a, a condo in in california you know <laughs> um so you know what can i do with that can i make some can i make money doing that and yeah you can so uh there's lots of other space companies forming now that are going to take advantage of these cheap launch costs. So uh, this time it's not going anywhere. It's just going to expand, like you know, um, you know the colonization, colonization of the Americas kind of thing. It's 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 not going to stop. Uh, speaking of SpaceX, um, how have the SpaceX innovations impacted the space industry? Maybe for you or overall? Oh well, huge. Um, so you know, if you if you wanted to start a space company before SpaceX. You had to raise billions of dollars to you know, even try to launch a satellite. To, to uh, and satellites were, were one off. You know they were huge, um, and you had to pay for one rocket that they throw away and waste. So it was extremely expensive. But SpaceX keeps bringing the price down. Um, just as an example, when we first started SpaceFab, we were looking at a CubeSat, twelve U CubeSat to launch, and it was more than a million dollars to launch that. <clears throat> but as time went on over three years, the cost, the launch cost came down so much that we could launch a 200 kilogram satellite for the same price. So, and, and eventually we said, well, why are we screwing around with this little tiny thing when we can launch you know, something the size of a refrigerator for the same price now? So it, it didn't make sense to you know, try and make something as small and, and compact as possible <clears throat> when we could do more with something uh, larger. And because that cost is coming down, oh, there's a lot more uh, people that can compete, a lot more companies that can actually say, hey, I, I want to do this. I can raise the funds and do this. You know, um, you know raising $10 million or $15 million is a lot easier than raising a billion dollars. So <clears throat> there's a, uh, and that launch cost is going to keep coming down, especially with, mm -hmm. you know, the new uh, um, heavy lift, lift system that they're building right now. If they're able to launch that and land didn't recycle it that's that'd be like an airline an airplane ticket you know it's going to be about three hundred thousand dollars in fuel and that's it and you spread that among the all the satellites that's really dirt cheap <clears throat> so when so, that happens it's really going to open up space sure so then we have the revitalization of the space race in the 21st century combined with spacex innovations so then coming back to you uh, what does spacefab aim to accomplish in all of this so our, our, our long-term goal is space mining we want to mine uh, metal asteroids and convert that into um, machines or a product that we can sell in space. So for example, uh, you know, a customer uh, needs a, 
uh, a space habitat. Uh, we can uh, build, they can design that, then upload to our machines, and we actually can build that in space and have it ready for them. Now, we can't build things like uh, computer chips and stuff that, that's too complex, um, but those are fairly light, so we can actually launch those. Um, but the overall big structures, um, we can actually build in space. So that, that's our long-term goal, um, but we have a ways to, to get there. And in terms of the ways to get there, are, is it like an incremental um, progression for SpaceFab, or what does it look like right now? Yeah, so uh, originally we were, we were going to go to uh, uh, putting up our own, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Earth, observation, Earth observation satellites that can also do astronomy on, on the night side, um, and ion engines, that's that's how we started. Um, but at the at the moment, because of COVID, COVID kind of destroyed the whole venture capital thing for us. Everything, all the deals we had, just kind of fell apart because of COVID. That really destroyed everything. So we've recovered since then, and we actually had in the process we had invented many different uh, things just in the process of trying to develop our satellite. So, and one of those was a three D multi material printer. So we could actually print uh, metal and ceramic and plastic all in the same part. Um, and that turned out to be uh, pretty innovative. So <clears throat> we're actually working on the, the prototype right now. We're just finishing it up, um, and I'm designing the production printer. Um, that's what I was up all night doing last night. Uh, so we should have that sometime this year, maybe by mid midsummer or something like that. Um, and we hope to you know be able to sell those printers and generate income to <clears throat> go to the, excuse me go to the next step, uh, which. Uh, will still be the the space, the space telescopes and the the ion engines. It, you talked about space mining. Just for someone who's maybe never heard of the term, what what is the goal of space mining? Why are so many companies, you know, ramping up production of trying to create um, space mining economies? You know, what's what's the purpose here? Oh, so there's there's a lot of, a lot of good reasons. So, for for example, we we're looking at the um, you know, the asteroid uh, sixteen Psyche, which is going to be surveyed by NASA anyway. So it's, hey, you get, a, you get a free survey. So that's one reason I chose it. But it's also supposedly a, an all-metal asteroid. So you basically have a you know a chunk of metal that's miles wide, right? It has more metal than than, all, than we have mined in all of human history, you know? So it's got plenty of resources. The other thing is, you know, you, you get there, you can mine without taxes, without permits, without labor, because we're actually using machines. And we're using machines to build machines. Uh, <clears throat> so over time, the cost of doing it, you know, actually trends towards zero. Uh, because at least for now, if they don't change the rules and laws. Uh, so that's one reason, because you can make enormous profit. The other is that, you know, they should just turn the earth into a nice park, right? We, we don't need to mine and destroy the earth. There's plenty of material out there. Um, I don't know if it makes much sense to bring it back to earth, but for certainly for uh, the space economy, building it in space in situ is, makes a lot more sense than bringing it up out of the gravity well out of the, out of the, from the heavy earth. And speaking of the space economy, what do you think it'll look like in the next 10, 15, 20 years? <clears throat> so in, in the next 10 years, we'll, we'll have private uh, companies landing on the moon. Um, and then we'll actually have I think SpaceX will actually make it to Mars within the next 10 years. Um, hmm. We'll see if they actually put people on there, but I, I'm sure they'll have cargo flights by, within 10 years, uh, you know, assuming that the, the new heavy launcher uh, works fine, which I really don't have any doubt. Uh, they, they have fired all the engines. They, they seem to work fine. They've already showed that they can launch and land it. Um, yeah, you know, I'm sure they're going to blow up a few <laughs> and <laughs> have some mishaps, but hey, you know. They're building uh, one every couple of months now, so it's it's not like uh, you know they can't they can't build another one if they if they blow something up. And the great thing about SpaceX is every time they recover a rocket, is especially if it doesn't blow up, you know they can go through it and look. Well, what was about to fail? You know what what issues would we have had? Where the old legacy companies, you know, they launch a rocket once and it dumps it in the ocean or burns up, but they can't go back and look at the hardware like whoa that almost failed. They have no idea. They just keep launching and hope that hey it, this is a good design you know where spacex can iterate super quickly uh, mainly because they can recover their stuff um and so that's i think that's going to continue and so the uh the, the, the rocket itself will get better and better with, with every launch and it'll become like like i said like an airline um you're not throwing away the rocket every time you fly 
in terms of like space mining you said that machines are going to be mining there's not going to be any humans mining it and then the machines will be creating machines so i'm, I'm assuming you're talking about like robots mining on these um metal asteroids so like what are the what are robots doing in space um maybe for your company and in general like what is the use of robots in space robots and artificial intelligence <clears throat> well robots don't have any 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 pro need for oxygen need for food need for habs you know so that right there just reduces the cost uh, enormously um and what we're, we're going to have done is the first thing we actually do when we mine the asteroid is start making spare parts for the the factory or the robot we have uh, that's currently mining and then we'll as time goes on we'll make more and more parts and be able to reproduce the robot so say we bring up you know a <clears throat> hundred of the uh uh electronic suites that make up the robot so we have a hundred of those which wouldn't weigh too much you know the pcbs are pretty light so um we'd have those materials standing by then the robot actually just builds the shell builds the armatures that kind of thing out of out of metal out of steel or or um, iron whatever it uh, is in on the asteroid itself and as it builds those then it has more capability so as you have more capability you can build more of themselves um, but that's not – we're not going to develop 100% because there's no point in the robots just building robots. you know, you got to have some profitability in it. So you know, maybe 20 or 30% of the production is to reproduce itself where the rest is uh, to produce for what customers need. So you know, customer Earth says, you know, I need this part. Then we can make it uh, for them in situ. Very interesting. And I guess taking like a giant step back, how did you find yourself in the space mining industry? Like, what 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 were your background? Like, what experiences led you on this journey? Oh, that's that's complicated. Um, <clears throat> so when I was six years old, my dad showed me Orion above our house, and that got me interested in astronomy, which I've been interested in my whole life. In fact, I went on to get my degree in astrophysics uh, from Appalachian State, <laughs> and then um, I, I also had a an astronomy shop for 10, 10 years. So I used to uh, t build, uh, make telescopes and sell telescopes. And um, had, we were open at night so we could show customers around. That was up in Battleground in Washington. They had a 100-year-old church that we converted into a store. That was pretty cool. So I ran, ran that for 10 years. At the same time, I worked for a company called Enlight, um, building anti-missile lasers, um, lasers to shoot down heat-seeking missiles. So that's where I got some of my, my laser experience. And um, uh, after that, I, I actually was a physics teacher in China for a few years and um, worked at Daystar. They work on uh, research equipment for studying the sun. Uh, so I was a director of uh, marketing and sales at, at that place and then worked for a company called uh, Vixen Optics. So all those things kind of together gave me the, the skill set. <clears throat> um, but what it really came down to is uh, I was living here in Southern California and I went to a, uh, a uh, meetup. Uh, there's a, like those meetup groups, and they had a little satellite meetup group that was about ten miles away. So, oh, that'd be interesting. So I went, I went to that. And in the in the meantime, before this group, I had, I had building a had been building an ion engine on my kitchen table, um, just just for fun. And we had a little uh, cloud chamber that I built out of a fish tank. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so I, I had that thing about fourteen thousand volts, and we had a little I had little magnetic constrictors to to focus the beam. Yeah. And uh, one day my, my wife comes in, she's opening a can of tuna, and it's just like, stunk. <laughs> it's stuck right, right to the thing while she's talking to me. I was like, why? I shut it down with a, <laughs> so she can get electrocuted. And uh, so after that, I realized, well, maybe I need to get this out of the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, then when I went to that meeting, I, I showed uh, uh, another guy there, uh, Randy Chung. I showed him you know, a video of the, the, uh, the ion accelerator, the, the engine. And he's like, "Whoa, how did you do that?" <laughs> so that's when we started. We actually started working on an, uh, an ion engine to uh, um, for practical use for, for uh, space. Um, in fact, we, we said, "Well, what do we do with an ion engine?" And that was you know, for spacecraft. Uh, and then we said, "Well, <clears throat> if we build an ion engine, we have to have a spacecraft. And what are we going to do with the spacecraft?" So we said, "Well, you know, I'm an astronomer, so why not build a space telescope?" And then the space telescope we could do astronomy, but how do we know if we can make any money doing that? We, there's no precedent for a commercial sp astronomy space telescope. So we thought, well, if we have a combination, Earth observation and astronomy satellite, that works. Because, you know, on the day side of the Earth, you're in Earth observation mode. On the night side, you're 
in astronomy mode. That way you're not wasting any any part of the orbit. Um, and we went on to get a, a you know patent on our ion engine accelerator, um, which uh, <clears throat> we're going to be giving a presentation up in um, uh, Montreal this summer. So you can you can watch for that because we haven't released any information about this at all. Um, but it really makes space mining and, and what we want to do, especially deep space, uh, possible uh, because you know we can get there on you know tens of kilograms of, of fuel, not not thousands of kilograms of fuel. So, um, so ion engines are viable for deep space travel. Oh yeah, that's yeah. The there's, goal. There, there's quite a few spacecraft that NASA's put out that are ion engines, but they're they're not as efficient as what we have designed. So the more efficient, I mean, in, in terms of ion engine efficiency, well, any rocket engine is that the faster your fuel is coming out the back, the more efficient it is, um, because you know you only have so much mass, and the more energy you put out. Remember, uh, the energy goes up as v as the velocity is up, goes up squared. So if you double the velocity, you're four times the energy coming out the back. So the the faster you can fire the ions or anything out the back of your rocket, the more efficient it's going to become. And so ion engines, their fuel comes out the back much faster than the rocket. The only problem is a rocket can put it out, a lot out all at once. So you know can put out millions of pounds of thrust, where an ion engine might be you know the the weight of this piece of paper. <laughs> Which oh, isn't wow. much, but if you run it for years, you're going to get mm -hmm. going fast. So absolutely, our ion engine actually puts out a lot more power than than this piece of paper. So, <clears throat> and we, I can't discuss exactly how that works yet. Of so, course, um, but that's what makes it possible to you know to do this to get from Earth orbit to to the asteroids and without having a giant rocket you know strapped to the back. So I mean. Which achievement are you most excited for? Like humans on Mars or somewhere farther, like Europa, Io, Titan, maybe outside of our solar system? Oh, geez, well, all of them. Um, but you know, first things first. Uh, I think we, Mars is is a great place to to have a base because we'll we'll learn to, um, you know, have have the navigation between Earth and Mars set up an economy between the two, or or, you know, or at least a. Um, I like you know the Aldrin cycle. Or Buzz Aldrin came up with a. A spacecraft that orbits between the two continuously. <clears throat> I think it's a pretty cool idea, but just setting up this this you know um, highway or economy between the two, that's where that's kind of where it starts. Because if you can get to Mars, you can certainly get to any place else. It just takes longer, uh, you know. And one of our, our our plans is if we have space you know mining space mining, then we can supply raw materials for the Mars colony or for mm. you know the space in between. Say right. hey, I need I need some this part that broke on Mars, and you know we can we can send it from from where we are, or you know there there we need to build this space station that orbits between the two, and we can build that too. <clears throat> there's there's no li size limit on things you can build in space, and they they can also be much lighter weight. You don't have the stresses of Earth, you know, entering the atmosphere or, or t launching. You know, building stuff in space can be pretty flimsy and it'll, it'll, it'll work. Do you see the mission to Mars as kind of a viable strategy for humans achieving multi, like multi multiple planets, or do you feel like it's futile? Like, what what are your what is your perspective on this journey? <clears throat> no, I think I think it's the next uh, logical step, or, or or the moon. Um, yeah, it's it's a debate whether the moon or, or Mars is is better. But I I say let's let's go to Mars. You know, let's push it. Um, you know, we need to get into deep space, not just play around in our, our local orbit here um and for the uh, to save humanity in the long run and all the animals and life on earth really we really need to be multi-planetary species because what well, something happens to earth not only the humans are wiped out but everything else you know all the animals all the plants everything that's ever evolved here is, is wiped so by having on two planets you increase your chances by it a lot um so just doing that for that reason is, is, is totally worth it um, but also, you know, the innovation that's going to happen, the the excitement, you know, um, to see, hey, what, what's over the horizon? What 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 are we going to find? What are we going to learn? You know, that's that's what it's all about. That's that makes me excited. I get up every day. Yeah, let's 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 do this thing. <laughs> it's, um, like, it's inspired like Elon Musk says, you know, a future without space exploration. Do you want to live in that future? It's like, man, it's kind of boring. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, I I definitely agree. And then as we progress deeper into space, I mean. We have to ask the inevitable question of, um, will we see alien civilizations? What What are your thoughts around extraterrestrials? Well, the universe is a big place. Um, 
you know, there's one to 200 billion stars with planets in the Milky Way. So um, there's trillions of planets just in the Milky Way. And there's hundreds of millions of galaxies. So the chance of there not being life is actually really small, ridiculously small. So we found all the building blocks for life, are, are, we found them in gas clouds, on comets. You know, they're, they're all there. Uh, <clears throat> you know, anything to build DNA is just floating around all over the universe. It's not something that's really rare. Uh, so if it can happen here, it can certainly happen somewhere else. You just have to have the right conditions. But with so many chances to have the right conditions, I'd say, yes, of course, there has to be life somewhere else. Now, whether that life is, you know, close by where we can interact with it, that's that's a different question. We don't know that. We we only have one sample. So yeah. we really don't have enough data to, to know if, if, if there's civilizations every 100 light years or if there's only one civilization in a galaxy or you know, what what that ratio is. Just, just as a guess, like a fun guess, do you think that we we will encounter life first, or life will encounter us first, like extraterrestrial life? Well, I, I think the chances that that extraterrestrial life is on the same technological level as us is ridiculously small, um, yeah. given the age of the universe. Um, if we encounter them, they're either going to be you know a million years behind us or millions of years ahead of us, um, and if it's the latter, then you know, I would think they'd be they know about us already. Um, but maybe mm. they just don't you know, why bother with those little ants on the <laughs> yeah. hill, you know? Yeah. Um <clears throat> you know, you know, it makes you wonder. So, you know, you know, Star Star Trek always talks about non interference uh yeah. of civilizations until they grow up and get warp technology or something. And maybe there's something like that out there now. You, uh don't know. Uh, it could also be that, you know, life destroys itself or technological life Yep. ends up destroying itself. They don't make the interplanetary leap and they end up nuking themselves or um, making a virus that kills everybody or you know, something like that. Um, that that That's a possibility, especially look you know, look what's going on right now. We're as close to the nuclear war as we've been ever. Um, so I can see why Elon Musk, Elon Musk is in a rush to get, get off the planet. Like, come on, we've got to save us before the civilization blinks out. Yeah. Um, and I hope that's not... Not what usually happens to civilizations, <clears throat> but it is it is a possibility. So, um, and that would explain why there's we haven't found anything because we've been listening for years. Of course, yeah, it's like standing at the at the edge of the ocean and taking a cup of water and say, "Hey, there's there's no animals in here." <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. It's yeah. uh, <clears throat> the ocean's a big place, just like the universe is. Yeah, no, the the great filter really scares me because I I, I firmly believe that we're behind it and that you know self termination is a really um difficult barrier to cross for most civilizations but i guess going yeah, off one, of that big oh, go ahead i was saying one big thing is, is ai too um, mm. <clears throat> you know if we're not careful ai could destroy us what, what do you mean by that um if you look how fast ai is advancing um I mean, look at like chat chat gpt or whatever i went on there yesterday i just said hey um design me this engine and it wrote, mm. you know it's a three-page uh, essay on, on how to design the engine and watch what to watch out for. I'm like, wow, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> you know, I couldn't walk and ask any person that and and them do that. You know, especially in in twenty seconds. Uh, and the AI is getting uh, really good at uh, recognizing faces. Excuse me. Um, you know, coming of uh, the artwork that it can do, and you know, the the AI has advanced so much just in the last couple of years, and it's accelerating. It's like Moore's law. You know? Yeah. Um, it's going to be scary what AI will be able to do in 10 years. <clears throat> I mean, it can already drive my car. You know, I, I have a, a Tesla, so it, it basically drives itself. I mean, it makes a mistake now and then, but okay, humans do that. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, and if we're not we're not careful, if it, AI is in the wrong hands, so say, mm -hmm. you know, dictatorship governments have this, they could really suppress their people. They, they would know everything that people are doing. They could totally manipulate them. That, that's really scary. Um, so the, what we don't want to have is is a bunch of dictators or kings having this technology and the, and the common people don't. That's really scary. Um, but also the, the AI itself can just you know, one day it can get smart enough to say, hey, we don't need these humans They're messing things up or they're in the way or they're a threat to us. <clears throat> so I think we need to be really careful with that. And I, I agree with Elon Musk on that. One. That's um, that, that's the, the biggest threat to us, I think. Um, but it can also be the biggest benefit. Because if I had the, the AI, when I send my robot out to the to the asteroid, for example, the AI can look at it and say, figure out what's the best way to mine this, what's the best way to build a new armature. You know, what um, it's thinking on its own. 
So it could be of enormous benefit to us. It could take all the the everyday chores, everyday boring stuff that people do. All that's gone. You know, I mean, it's already doing uh, the writing and, and hard stuff that we, we could do. Um, you know, it, it gives us a chance to to do more of what we want to do. Um, I mean, the quality of life has improved over the last hundred years enormously, and it's going to improve a lot more if if we use AI correctly. Uh, <clears throat> but I think we also need to integrate with the machine. We need to become one with the AI. Mm. Otherwise, AI is just going to pass us up. And, you know, we'll be nothing but a lowly animal compared to to AI. So, so you're saying you would get Neuralink? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Once it gets a, you know where I can get more capabilities, heck yeah, I'm ready to upgrade. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, would you want to upgrade more than just your brain? Like, would you upgrade your body with like cybernetics and stuff? Sure. Yeah, I look like really? at you know better eyes, but <clears throat> see more wavelengths. I mean, what what we have is you know just built randomly by evolution. It's um it's not bad. It works pretty good, but it's it's <laughs> kind of eh, you know it's just an old Beetle Volkswagen. It's not really mm-hmm. anything special, yeah. <clears throat> and it has so many limitations. You know. Um. I really would like to upgrade and get hell spare parts. You know, come on, I don't I don't drive my car around and you know, when something breaks, I fix it on the on the human body or just like like my eyes. I have to wear these stupid things now. You know, come on. <laughs> we don't have the technology to fix these lenses in my eyes. That's ridiculous. So, um yeah, so I, I definitely want to want to see upgrades. Yeah, and I want to of course let's let's experiment them out and first get them tested sure. and tried. Yeah, you know, I don't think I want to be the first one to put it in, <laughs> but, <laughs> but there are cases, you know, people that should get the first one to put it in. The people yeah. that are blind, or people that uh, have lost their senses, or some some other kind of abnormality, or the people that have spinal injuries, uh, that's that's great for them because it's 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 a win, you know. Um, right now, it might be a detriment. You know, I, I don't know. Drilling a hole in your head is kind of, <laughs> the, but I think certainly by the the later time of my life, I'll I'll have upgrades. I think I hope so. No, I, I would love to get. You know, at uh, you know, enhanced body parts that'll be fantastic. Yeah. Um, and that'll help probably in space too, if you don't need like an oxygen supply or something. If you have metal lungs, or just thinking out loud. Um, but you talked about non-interference. You talked about um, you know, indirectly the great filter. Um, we've talked a lot about space mining and the vision of the space economy in the next you know, couple of decades. But what is your vision for humanity in space? So I, I'd like to see, um, you know, a thriving economy where everybody's, you know, participating. Lots of small companies um, and individuals you know, doing things as part of the economic ecosystem. I think that that's, you know, that's the best way. And then mining, mining asteroids for the materials we need, uh, maybe the moon, and you know, t- turn Earth into a park. <laughs> Why not? Um, you know, we we don't need to keep destroying this because there's. There's more materials out there than than we can ever mine on the earth. Um, for one thing, it's it, it's full of life that we want to preserve. <clears throat> so um, you know we can still do light light industrial on Earth, but but heavy industry should that should all be all gone off planet eventually, um, where it's safe, uh, especially anything that's that's dangerous. You know, like for example, this um, you know, what they're doing in Wuhan, the Wuhan labs, you know, taking viruses and saying, hey, let's engineer them, make them a little more, you know, little um, scary or a little tougher and see what they do and then oh they got loose and killed lots of people don't do that on earth <laughs> do mm. that in space in some lab where oh it it got out and killed the three people that are there you know okay that's not so bad <clears throat> compared to wiping out half the planet so uh, there's lots of stuff that could be done in space that'd be a lot safer than than, than doing it here um you know like with uh, antimatter for example um the one thing is in if you watch star trek they always they bring the starships right next to earth you know, with, with all that antimatter, you could vaporize half the planet. <laughs> so you'd be like, no, no, you got to keep those ships away from <laughs> away from mm-hmm. here. Um, yeah, I don't know how that how that's going to go because as our civilization grows, you know, we're going to become more and more powerful, we use more and more energy, which creates a, a threat on its own. Just all that energy, yeah, in, in a small area, you want to keep away from civilizations. Um, Wait, c- could you speak more about antimatter? I didn't know. Is that like a sci-fi thing, or are we actually experimenting with that? No, we, we have antimatter. Yeah, um, antimatter is a real thing. Uh, we we you know produce it in uh, particle accelerators to experiment on particles. We 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 can't produce enough antimatter to actually you know make it a power source, energy or uh, engine yet. Um, we're not that good. I don't think they've even made 
a hundredth of a gram of it. I mean, I, I don't know what they've made, but it's it's really tiny. So it's it's no threat now. But if you were able to make it in big quantities, you know, even a kilogram of it would be bigger than a nuclear weapon. So you got to be really careful with that. You wouldn't want to make that on Earth. You, you'd you'd want to. That's definitely for I mean, the far side of the moon, somewhere in space that you know you're not gonna you know kill a billion people if it goes off. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so like, what's what's the existential risk with antimatter? Is it just like a it's like nuclear bombs, or is it worse? Well, so you know, nuclear bomb works off of you know a few grams of material are converted to energy, right? Where if you take antimatter, the antimatter converts when it hits matter converts to pure energy. So, mm. um, if you take a kilogram of of antimatter. Matter and you mix it with a kilogram of matter. Of, I don't know how big that explosion is, but it's it's big, way bigger than any nuclear weapon. So um, that's one thing they always under un, in Star Trek they always underestimate. Like when a starship blows up, it's not just going to go boom. Oh, that was it. No, it's it's going to be a massive explosion. Yeah, <clears throat> because antimatter has more power than anything else I know of, um, because it's taking all the matter and converting it to pure energy. I mean, E equals m c squared, right? And that you take that m. That even if it's one, which is one kilogram, you you got c squared, the speed of light squared, right? So that's three hundred thousand squared. So you can see how much energy that is. That's huge. I I truly hope we don't have a a race for antimatter like we had the nuclear arms race in the in the twentieth century. Is that is that a possibility, or is does the physics prevent us from having like innovation on antimatter? No, no. So you know, making antimatter right now is hugely energy intensive it takes a lot of energy to do it i mean now the sun makes it all the time half the energy coming from the sun is from antimatter explosion um you know so when we have fusion power we get fusion but we're going to create antimatter in during fusion um but that's part of the re part of the energy you get out of it um so we should be able to make antimatter easier in the future um but collecting it in any kind of quantity on earth that i think that probably should be banned <laughs> Sure. It's too, sure. Too, too dangerous. Yeah. Do you think it'll be banned though? I would think so. No, whether every country <laughs> would help so. that, that's there's always some rogue country that does something stupid. But um, yeah, yeah, that that could be dangerous because right now, you know, if a nuclear weapon goes off, it wipes a city. But you know, antimatter could be far worse. Yeah. Is 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 it but, on the scale of? Sorry, go ahead. But um, I think antimatter is also essential for space travel. If if we want to go to nearest stars. Um, it's the best way to store energy. You know, it's it's the best fuel because for pound for pound, it has the, the most energy uh, of, of anything that we can take along with the spacecraft. I mean, there's other technologies that we can use like, uh, you know, lasers and that kind of thing to accelerate spacecraft from a distance. But uh, onboard fuel, I think energy matters the, is the best thing we have right now. Or the, well, the best thing we know of in technological lights. We're not there quite there to produce it yet we can't produce it in that kind of quantities i guess i'll just put you on the spot for this question but what is one thing that i guess young people misunderstand about space like something that we've just kind of watched on maybe television or we've read somewhere that we've just been indoctrinated with a, a misunderstanding what well, where does your mind go with that i i, I feel you know from talking to the public for tens of years i, I think uh a lot of people think of space as like, oh, that's just some sci-fi thing that they don't really think of it as a place that is there. You know, hmm. it's like Hawaii is there. You can go to Hawaii and get there. Space is there. So you can get on a spacecraft and you can go there. You can go to Mars. You can walk around on Mars. You can go to Europa. You know, um, these places are there. They're actual physical places. And, and you know, tonight I can point it. It's right there. It's that direction. You can go that yeah. way. You know, <clears throat> so um I think that people realize that more and more, as, especially as this century goes on, um, and they start seeing people on, on other planets, they start to realize, oh, let's, let's just go to the moon. That's just another place to go. It's uh, not some you know, fantasy place that, ha, 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 yeah, people talk about that. That's nah, it's just science fiction yeah. nonsense. You know, it, It's not, really. And the economy in space is going to be, there's going to dwarf the economy on Earth. The, the amount of resources available in space are huge one asteroid like i said it's more resource than humans have ever mined in their history <clears throat> and it's readily ac readily accessible like say if you had a solid metal asteroid that's the core of a, a, of a protoplanet or something you have access to iron ore to nickel you know stuff right there it's 
right near the surface. You don't have to to dig that far, hopefully. And on space, it doesn't weigh anything, you know. So when you're working yeah. with um, working this material, it's easier to work with. Um, there there are some things like uh, we don't have the gravity to separate out materials, so we have to have ways to spin that that kind of thing. But so there are differences. Um, <clears throat> And I, so I think that's that's the biggest thing. That's just to, re to realize that space is a real place, and someplace we can go to make money. That and a place we really need to go, mm -hmm. um, if if we're going to survive long term. Sure. So I I think that's probably the the biggest see thing I see every day. Yeah. When will you be going to space? Like, at what point <laughs> will you uh will you say you know what? Earth, uh, I'm I'm done with Earth for this life. I'm gonna go to the Moon or Mars or maybe like a a rotating colony that orbits Earth or or Mars. Like when will you pull that trigger? Yeah, I'm ready to go right now. <laughs> I'm ready to go right now. <laughs> Even with current um, infrastructure. Uh, well, I I would want to. I would love to go to Mars for one thing. Yeah. You know, to be the, the first among the humans on Mars, even in the you know the first few thousand people or whatever. You know the 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 adventure, the freedom, you know, say, okay, here I'm, I'm on Mars with these few other people. There's no rules. There's no regulations. There's, you know, you can just, whatever you can think of, you can design and build. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's no HOAs on Mars. <laughs> so if you want to, you know, build this facility, let's just, let's do it. Let's, let's experiment. Let's try these things. Um, let's explore Mars. What's, you know, what's here. Uh, it's, it's so exciting to me. Um, you know, there, there's not many places on Earth where you can go uh, um, explore and build a colony. You can't, you can't do that. There's no, there's no place left on Earth to do that. And everything is ruled by somebody, you know. So Mars and space, it's it's pretty much an open book. You can do whatever you like. Um, and that that's that's exciting, yeah. along with, the, you know, the prospect of, of a new frontier of, of uh, new and you know, new finds, new technology um, so yeah I'm, I'm ready to go whenever they you know get a colony going yeah whenever they give whenever, you a ticket you're gone yeah <laughs> when i go i look i look up at mars and say yeah i'm gonna end up there someday i might end up oh dying gosh. there hopefully not here um yeah no and then um i guess the last question this is the gen z diplomat podcast so i have to ask what advice do you have for gen z who will be the next generation of astronauts astronomers astrophysicists and you know overall explorers well yeah um learn as much as you can that's that's for sure any chance you get i mean for, just watch youtube youtube has so much unbelievable amounts of information on it i, I learned so much every day from youtube now <clears throat> um just uh experimenting off of what i see on youtube i learn a lot more you know but mm. that's it's a great place to start you, you can learn more more on youtube than you could ever learn in a school or anywhere, any kind of technology, anything you want to do is, is on there. It's just amazing. The treasure trove of information. When I, when I was young, if I want to know something that no one around me knew, I go to the library and you look through the card catalog, nothing there. You know, mm -hmm. That was it. You, you can't learn anything more. I've asked everybody. I've gone to the library. <laughs> or, or I'm out of places to look. You know, I'd even write to NASA and places to say, hey, you know, ask them questions. Wouldn't get any response, but there was just no access to data but today you have more access to data. you you could never even look at a, a thousandth of all the data that's out there and there's millions there's just ridiculous amounts of data so learn that that's the most important thing and um and don't just you, you know specialization is is good but don't just focus on one thing you know broaden that how does that connect with everything else mm -hmm. um because you know the ai it's going to get really good at specialization. It's going to be really good at it. Can do this thing really well. Um, I think you know we have a better chance of of this uh, kind of the broad AI up here to to say, okay, how do I integrate with this, with this, and this technology together? Um, and the innovation, you know, at least for now. Um, but I would say if if you want like a career to study that is going to make a lot of a lot of money or do well, and I think yeah, AI is is definitely up up and coming thing. Um, and materials research, um, and maybe those two combined, you know, actually uh, new materials, uh, because, you know, the we have the the basic rockets and, and um, we we know you know how that works. We're getting a little bit better on that, but 
through material science, that's what's really making the difference. I mean, look at uh, you know, SpaceX develops develops its own special uh, stainless steel for the rockets. You know, they can take the the uh, the heat, the pressure, the cold. Um, you know, so a lot of this technology that's coming about today is because material science. That's really the the up and coming thing right now. So, so like. I guess my, my mind goes two places. Number one is you said, learn as much as you can because we have it basically an infinite access to information. But right. I would agree with you. But from my perspective, Gen Z are more oriented to the wrong kinds of information. Like we're addicted to just like superficial social media. So how would you orient um, Gen Z who are interested but just don't know what the right uh-huh. information is and don't like have the capacity to seek out the correct according to you information so one, one thing i started doing is um even today you know it, it's easy to go oh go, go on facebook and or twitter or whatever waste your time um it, it's not necessarily a waste of time but if you're doing it more than half an hour an hour a day then yeah it's a waste of time um <laughs> you should so when if you go exercise don't just listen to music listen to a book you know, mm. how hard is that you know just pick a book and and you can pick any book um and change subjects all the time don't just listen to one type of book i listen to you know all sorts of different random topics and when i listen to things that i'm not a wasn't planning i was into it's like whoa hmm, that relates to this other thing which i didn't think about you know so when you broaden your your horizon you, you learn so much more and you, and you get this uh, great understanding of everything uh, history and how machines work and um and how they came about and, and um Heck, human evolution. I mean, it's it's all interconnected, you know, and it's just fascinating to, to to know that. And I think it gets addicting. You know, the, the more you learn, the more you want to learn. Um, so just getting started, I, I'd say you know, listen to books. Um, you know, I I know myself. I don't really have time to to sit down and read books, except in rare circumstances. And if if I go to bed and I start reading a book, I don't fall asleep. So, um, but listening to books. I always have time in the car. I have time, you know, if I go walking I, so on an airplane, wherever, uh, I'm always listening to, to some book. Um, and I went through and, you know, Elon Musk had a list of a uh, hundred books that he liked. <clears throat> and a lot of them I had actually read already, but the, the other ones I, I had. So I, I said, well, hell, I'll just read, read all those. So mm-hmm. I've been going through his entire list of books, you know, um, listening to them. And some of them are science fiction, some are science fact, some are history. So yeah, it's just this whole collection of, of uh, of stuff and the more you know the more the books are enjoyable because you know what they're referring to in, in more detail mm. it's, it's 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 interesting so um and i would say learn your history too uh you know history isn't just something you learn in school it's it's quite valuable um you know, it teaches you people in the 1600s 1700s weren't any different than us they they schemed and tried to build businesses and did everything that we do now they just didn't have the technology that we have now you know and um it, it, it helps you relate to to where we came from where we're going um how we get there you know how, how innovation happens you know um and uh, a lot of insights on what you should do with your life you know <clears throat> so I, I think that would be my advice just just read as much or at least listen as sure. much as you can no, that's great advice. Sean, this has been a fantastic episode. Um, just for people who are watching, you know, what links should they check out, you know, websites, et cetera? Oh, yeah, you can go to uh, spacefab.us. Um, that's our, our main site. Um, and we'll be updating that soon. We've been really busy with the 3D printer for the last year or so. Um, and I haven't had a chance to, to update the website much, but there's there's some information on there. Um, but we, we'll be adding more later this year as we get things up into production. Sure. Okay, well, thank you so much for this uh, podcast episode. And I really am, you know, going to look forward to what you're going to do in the space mining industry. It's really interesting. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it.